So, let's go back to the first question I asked. What brought you here? I'd like to be happy. I'd like to be happier. I should be happy. I have, you know, incredible luck. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to, you know, look out the window and say, hey, life is good. And you don't? No. <laughs> I'm not going to get a lot of sympathy uh, from people, uh, frankly. I mean, I have the best job in the world, let's face it. I go anywhere I want, I do what I want. Hey everyone, this is Francesco Abruzzino with the Uncensored Report. That was Anthony Bourdain, uh, who commuted, committed suicide a few weeks ago. I, After that incident, and I kept hearing about his name, I decided to start watching his series on Netflix. And I had never seen him, never heard of him, never watched his flicks. Started watching them and loved it. Loved the person, loved the flicks. It was very interesting. Basically... Um, he would he'll go out and he looks at to different countries and he explores their culture, primarily around food. And you learn a lot about the different food that's out there, which gave me a, a, a concept, which I'm run by some restaurants about doing that in Sarasota County, where I film a, a production talking about their food and doing all that stuff, similar to how Anthony did it, but at a smaller level. Then um, he uh, today I was in the gym and he also talks about the culture in that city in those countries and i was watching the argentina one which i've never seen where he goes to bonasaurus and that's where he's in that scene that clip that i just played for you and i thought how ironic and basically he was talking about in argentina how so many individuals the majority of the individuals there go to see therapists the ones that can afford it and he decided to go to this lady. Now, I don't know how much is acting, how much is screenplay, but it basically it was perceived as though he was talking to a therapist and he talked about how he should be the happiest guy in the world. He travels everywhere. He meets a ton of people. He's, you know, he's this famous individual out there, but he's not happy. And why am I not happy? Um, so it was really interesting. You saw the actual clip there. And it brought to mind some of the challenges that we have in terms of um, psychiatric hospitals and the mental health crisis that we see on a regular basis with individuals like which is Parkland, um, this guy that just shot a bunch, killed five people at the, um, the Gazette. And what are we facing? What are the challenges? You know, a lot of people and myself too often wonder, is it the SRIs and is there more to it? But, you know, someone, I was listening to Joe Reagan's um, podcast and they were talking about it and one of the individuals uh, some doctor I, some individual I don't even know I think it, um, I can't remember the individual but he said you know I get the SRI concept I, I understand where they're coming from and that may pay a role I don't know but how many people are on SSRIs that don't go out and kill individuals it's the same concept with guns how many people own guns I own a gun I got carried in my pocket wherever I go I have one here I have one in my room everywhere but I don't go out and shoot people. Same concept. But dealing with this shortage, the shortage of this um, inpatient care for people, the mental illness. Um, you know, we used to have these mental illness facilities. They had a bad stigma associated with them. Anyone that saw uh, the one that flew over the cuckoo's nest remembers what it was like. But you have a number of individuals that are out there struggling with um, a wide variety, a wide range of psychiatric problems um, from of various issues that have impacted them throughout life. Um, the Journal of Psychiatric Services estimates that 3.4% of all Americans, and that's more than 8 million people, suffer from some type of psychological problem. And a lot of individuals will say, well, you're psychologically off base, you're, you're a nut job, um, because they perceive you as being a nut job because you don't adhere to their ideology, to their way of life, their way of thinking, and all that stuff. And so you do have some of that. But the disappearance of long-term facilities, um, psychiatric beds out there, um, how they've uh, disappeared and how it's escalated over the past decades, it's um, sparked this tremendous trend towards de institute institute in, I can't even say it, institutionalization <laughs> of psychiatric patients. Now you go there and they want to feed you a bunch of pills and they don't want to talk to you about your issues. And even the ones that do talk to you about your issues, you got often wonder, 
are they um, trained enough? Are they knowledgeable enough? Sure, they got their, their degree on the wall, but a lot of those individuals are going through their own issues or they may not be doing the best job they can to notice some concerns that are out there. Um, and they, they have attributed to this disappearance of the, these hospital beds, these state hospitals. Um, and a lot of individuals, a lot of people, a lot of professionals are starting to realize that individuals um, – could do better in the community and that's what brought about this whole revitalization and i don't know if i agree with that so they got rid of the hospitals and they followed through with what these individuals were thought was more of a community-based programs um they were probably well intended um but you could see that over the past few years since they've made these types of transitions you've seen the evaporation of um psych psychiatric therapy um, the spaces that are around there, the lack of su sufficient psychiatric beds. That's another problem. I, I was reading a few articles uh, prior to doing this. And that seems to be one of the main issues that you got this um, concerted effort out there to grow this community based cure options. And, you know, that may be re less restrictive. It, it grew out of the whole civil rights movement out there. But if you look at some of the reports, and they, this one article referred to a report that was out in 2012, you know, what, six years ago. It was from the Treatment Advocacy Center, and it's a nonprofit organization. And they go out, they work to remove treatment barriers for people with mental illness. And they found that the amount of psychiatric beds out there had decreased um, something like 14, 15 percent from 2005 to 2010. And that's a year when they had about over 50,000 state psych psychiatric beds. So that they did this breakdown of the number and basically it came out that only 14 beds were available per 100,000 people and how that was a concern. Um, they've, they also found that, not this particular group, but some individuals out there, um, this guy Sissy that they talked to found that most individuals that have these mental issues, um, because the lack of beds, find themselves either homeless or um, find themselves in pr prison. And many of the private mental health hosp hospitals that are still operating out there, you find challenges because some insurances will cover it, but the majority of them will not. And who can afford, what, $90,000 a month, $30,000 a month, or whatever those fees are to cover it. So you find that the majority of the individuals, the middle class, the lower middle class, can't handle it. And they go through the path of something like Medicaid to try to resolve their health care issues, which essentially means here's a pill, be on your way. Um, and as a result, many people are experiencing mental health issues, a mental health crisis. A lot of them, I guess, are ending up in emergency rooms. And the National Hospital Ambulatory, Ambulatory Medical Care Survey basically came out, and this was between 2001 and 2011, found that 6% of all emergency department patients had some type of psychiatric issue, some type of mental health issue. And about 11% were transferred to some type of facilities. But the problem is, once you go to those facilities, you they uh, according to the articles I've read, they can't take, t after 72 hours, you're back out in the street, back out into the world, back out to face the same trials and tribulations that led you to the breaking point. Um, you got some stuff, you know, Trump's been out there, he's... Um, um, Trump and many others have claimed that there's a connection exists between the guns and, um, like I said, with the SSRIs. And I believe some of that, but then I also got to sit there and think. And I, I'm an advocate of believing that firmly too, but I got to think that valid point that was made on Joe Reagan's that I touched on earlier. If you, how many people are on those but are now shooting? And the same concept that I said earlier, how many people have guns and are now shooting? So you got these people that want the guns taken away. Um, they're blaming the gun. And basically, he was illustrating that the people that are advocating notice the SSRI pills are taking the same concept. And it is. How many people with guns, I carry, I have several, aren't out there shooting up schools? How many people on SSRIs are the millions or thousands or hundreds of thousands of people aren't out shooting up schools. Um, the other thing is this uh, healthcare pay doctors, they're literally about helping these individuals. Um, they end up on their doorstep. They don't know what to do with them, the high costs associated with it.
the stigmatization out there. People uh, don't want to go in and be deemed mentally unstable. So you, you have a variety of issues. Uh, they're, they're basically, their cultural competence. One article touched on, you know, hey, are they Asian, Hispanic, Native American, LGBT? Are we looking into these different variables when we go into their background to try to see what some of the issues are? The access uh, that patients have to possible needed medicine or, or the over access, too much access to this stuff. Dealing with the policy cha changes both at the state, county, federal, state levels. Um, the advocating of integrated care um, and the overall preventing of mental illness. So... You know, we all know people that have probably committed suicide. I, I, my wife and I are good friends with a lady who, who her daughter, who I went to high school with, um, committed suicide. And I know it, it impacts the families significantly. And it's, uh, back to that video, you know, it's strange. And I, I think when I close out, I'll go back to the video for anyone that joins this um, in the middle of it. And it's, it's just strange because you hear them sitting there saying, you know, I um, should be happy, and I'm, that's just not. And I do have up on that picture, and on this next one, it's a bigger picture, you'll see the suicide hotline, 800-273-8255. Don't ever feel shamed. Don't worry about the stigma associated with it. Get help. Because remember, when you, if you do this, remember the impact it will have on your family. Fall back on them. Fall back on your friends, because a lot of them are there for you. A lot of them will care for you. So we'll watch this and then we'll close it out. Everybody have a great day. People that can afford it, but right. So let's go back to the first question I asked. What brought you here? I'd, I'd like to be happy. I'd like to be happier. I should be happy. I have, you know, incredible luck. Mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to, you know, look out the window and say, hey, life is good. And you don't? No. <laughs> I'm not going to get a lot of sympathy uh, from people, uh, frankly. I mean, I have the best job in the world, let's face it. I go anywhere I want, I do what I want. 